Yo, what's going on E7 fam? Pat here, back with another video. And in this one, we're going to talk about the custom Mystic Summon that is coming up on July 25th, 2024. This is kind of just another update to these tier lists whenever a new one comes out. So just kind of want to give you my two cents on it. Apologies for lack of streams and content. Uh, for those of you guys who are not in my Discord, you may or may not know. I came down with COVID. It's my first time having COVID. I still kind of have it. Uh, I'm on the tail end of it now. Uh, so apologies in advance for any kind of like uh, coughing, sniffles. Uh, honestly, brain fog. That was kind of the scariest part of the entire thing. I felt like I was like in a haze for the last couple of days. Um, so yeah, this is just going to be a, a more relaxed version of my normal tier list videos. I'm going to just kind of say my piece on characters and then move on. Um, whether that's long or short, who knows, right? There's not going to really be any fancy edits accompanying this video. Honestly, I'm just not 100% at this point. So uh, what it is what it is. Essentially, you get what you get. Hopefully, though, this is still of some help to you. So let's start by talking about what this custom Mystic event is, what's on it, and more importantly, what's not on it. So essentially, this is a replacement banner or a rerun banner, except instead of them having a curated three to four ML5s, you get to pick the characters on the banner. It does replace the banner after New Moon Luna. So for example, if you are a hundred away from pity on New Moon Luna, when this new banner, which comes out on July 25th, goes live, you are a hundred away from pity from whatever you put on that banner. So treat it accordingly as if it would be a rerun banner. You just get to choose what's on it. As for what's not on it, it's going to be the three most recent Moonlight 5 stars, those being Dragon Bride Senya, New Moon Luna, and Sea Phantom Politis. Pretty much every other Moonlight 5 star is fair game, so I'm going to talk about them. As you can see here, the first tier is Can't Choose. It's the ones that we already talked about. Now you might notice that the second tier is Why Wouldn't You Get Her? Right, Because I'll be honest with you guys, if you've been paying attention to high level PvP right now and you are somebody who cares about either Arena, Guild Wars, or World Arena in any sort of capacity, New Moon Luna is just that girl. Right, Like if Blood Moon Haste is the guy that runs the game, Luna is the girl that runs the game. They are pretty much husband and wife. They pretty much run this show. So if you care at all about PvP, get Luna. She really is that strong of a character. She has not made her debut yet in WC 2024, but just like Navy Captain Landy, which is last year's poster girl, this year's poster girl almost assuredly will pretty much be on permaban status or dominate the games that she's in in that tournament. She is just that strong. So yes, if you are on the fence on should I get Luna or should I save for X character, the answer is get Luna. Even if that character is haste, the answer is probably still get Luna because, well, Luna beats haste. So yeah, with that out of the way, that little disclaimer out of the way about Luna, let's move on to our first tier, which is gods. These are basically the characters that run the game, right? the best of the best characters that are not Moon, New Moon Luna uh, and these other ones that we don't have available. I'll be honest with you, the ones in Can't Choose, they would all also fall under gods. These are basically the people that dictate the current state of Epic 7, at least as far as PvP goes. So first up is Ambitious Tywin. Generically, the best knight in the game, right? Dragon Bride Senya could also lay claim to this, but Dragon Bride Senya is more of a bruiser. Whereas Ambitious Tywin is, as we've always talked about him here on the channel, just a win condition. He is a control win condition. He is a turn two win condition, right? He is somehow actually an anti-cleave win condition. He just does a lot, right? Battle Command gives him some viability against certain characters like Nequal from keeping your team from being bound. Uh, obviously staves off the insane amount of control in the meta that we have. His S3 flash, like I said, it's a win condition. It's a stun. It's an AoE defense break. 
And if he has Enrage off of his passive, it's unresistable, which could just completely decide games. Soul Burn makes it spammable every other turn, which is honestly ludicrous. And even his S1, Icy Storm Sword, is a pretty broken basic attack because it saps four souls from your opponent. There's just nothing about Tywin that's bad. Like, even his stat line is good. If I recall correctly, it's Fallen Cecilia's stat line, right? There's just nothing bad about Ambitious Tywin. Um, he allows you to just generate a lot of momentum for your team, and he's just generically good in most of the scenarios you'll find yourself in in the current meta. Uh, Blood Moon Haste is next. Uh, the character's just completely busted because of the rework. Um, the fact that everything deals true damage and that you get a massive AoE heal for like 20 plus percent of your team's health plus more if you're on Celestine, if you get a counter plus strip, is very debilitating. Uh, S3 being a, not only a true damage nuke, but you know killing most of the cast in the game with Blood Aura and being a full team revive is just debilitating. Like the character is just such a strong anchor in so many scenarios and it basically demands an answer because if they try not to deal with Blood Moon Haste or find an, a way to contain him, he will just allow you to rubber band and come back and win the game for free. Death Deal Array, uh, the control character in the game. <clears throat> Honestly, even his like quote unquote counters don't do enough, right? It's like Celine, Moon Bunny, and then Dragon King Sharoon. He still can have some kind of play through a lot of them. Um, he's just the control win condition. And again, control is like really strong right now. He's just very, very good in a lot of scenarios. Like if you're a turn two player, I feel like he's one of your best win conditions in the current format. Navy Captain Landy, last year's poster girl. Um, just we joked about it in the world's viewing watch party. Uh, I kept calling her Landy Uzumaki the main character of a shonen manga. She's got main character energy. Just if she high rolls you and salvos you, she just wins. Like it, it, it's it. Like unless you have like Rowana on your team, right? If she just decides like, Oh, everything's a counter Elbra salvo. You die. Like there's, it's, there's nothing you can do about it. Right. It's like have Nikwal and bind this character, uh, or have like Luna and seal her. Right. And pray she still doesn't counter uh, or have like Rowana. Uh, otherwise, like if she just goes nuts, you win. Right? I mean, there's still Lone Crest and Bologna, but as you could probably tell by eyeballing uh, the tier list, a lot of Landy's counters are not particularly good in the, to the rest of the field right now. So that's why I still think she deserves a spot here. She still has a stellar performance in Worlds. I still think she will continue to see play at Worlds just because she's just that strong of a win condition. And as we saw with Poopus matches, if you just get lucky, if like if if again she's just Landy Uzumaki and decides to Rasengan her way to victory, you just win. That's all there is to it. Ah, uh, Zio. Uh, Zio is just a guaranteed turn one that holds book. Like that. That should pretty much be it. That's the entire description for why he's in God tier. Book is the best artifact in the game. He guarantees you turn one, which is the strongest thing you can do in the game. So by Having the ability to do the strongest thing in the game while holding the strongest item in the game, like that should be it. Like that that's all you really have to say about him. He sets up pretty much every aggressive um draft or cleave composition, pretty much that there is, all the good ones. And even for the turn two players like myself, he is a basically a uh, a way for you to speed contest if your opponent doesn't take him and for some reason doesn't ban him. You can absolutely just like kind of crucify somebody for trying to go fast early on and putting Zio, like a full damage bruiser Zio, in the three pick ban slot. It completely messes up a lot of people on ladder. I've done it to a lot of people. Uh, so don't think just because he's a aggressive cleave opener style character that every account can't take advantage of him. He's really that important. A number of my friends even have multiple copies of him because he has multiple use cases. He's very, very strong. Next up, uh, we have demigods here, right? These are the ones that are still very strong in the meta. These are like the top meta picks behind the gods. Still certainly strong um, when a lot of games are represented. I think a lot, you've probably seen them uh, as well at, uh, at Worlds. First up is Abyssal Euphine. Uh, very strong carry. 
but somehow a lot more susceptible uh, to counters than Landy. Like, she just doesn't high roll like Landy high rolls, right? If you get an Elbrus or a counter with Abyssal, it's like, oh, well, it's just a, a small AoE tap, right? It's not that big of a deal. Whereas Landy is like, oh, well, not only did I take a ton of single target damage, but my team also took AoE damage, and she probably gained back more health than I dealt to her, right? That doesn't really happen with Abyssal. So the threat of her counter is not nearly as bad as Navy Captain Landy. It's bad. It's just nowhere near as game-breaking as Navy Captain Landy. And again, I feel like it's easier to shut down Abyssal than uh, Landy. Like, things that shut down Landy also shut down Abyssal, whereas, like, things that shut down Abyssal don't always necessarily shut down Landy. Like, she just feels like she's harder to contain. But the threat of trauma, just being a free game win, is still there. Character is still very good. Also, really important to point out the S2 passive again. Like, the CR reduction is still very, very massive on this character. Like, she... It's weird because back in, like, January, I would have told you there's no way that this character is even remotely fair. But now, of, like, the quote-unquote, like, broken damage dealers in the game, she feels like one of the most fair ones right now. That tells you how kind of far we've come. Uh, Dragon King Sharoon, I personally think that she's probably, like, the best or second best character in this tier, but that's my own personal biases. Um, I originally had her in Gods, but after some thinking, these characters that are up here in Gods, you could reliably pick any of these characters in your first two picks and probably dominate a game. That's not the case with Dragon King Sharoon. I think the earliest you could pick her is three. Obviously, notably, she's very good against Death Dealer Ray. She's also very good against Ambitious Tywin. So she's just got a good matchup against two of the gods, right? Um, but more importantly, that she has build flexibility. You could play her slow and bulky um, if you're more of a uh, turn two player, but you could also play her very aggressively, like 250, 260 speed as like an aggro bridge or even like a cleave setup because her S3 is a full team strip plus a pushback and it defense breaks knights and soul weavers, which uh, I don't know if you noticed, but if we take a look at our top tiers here, uh, we got knight, soul weaver, soul weaver, knight. Um, and even here, like in this own tier, right? You've got another knight here in abyssal. Basically, most of the things that you're going to be fighting that you actually give a crap about, right? Like your Dragon Bride Senyas and stuff, uh, your ML Haste, those are Knights and Soul Weavers. So she will death break them and sets up easy kills on them. So she's just a very consistent and reliable uh, answer to a lot of the things that you're going to be playing against. It's not necessarily just for her amazing matchup against certain gods. She's just generically universally useful, I feel like, in a lot of scenarios. And it's why... She was one of the most ban protected characters in the Asia server qualifiers. Uh, next up is Conqueror Lilius. Uh, don't get it twisted. This character used to be a god. Half the reason she is in demigods is because uh, essentially she has definitely fallen off, right? Sea Phantom Politis definitely took her, her job. Uh, there's no doubt about that. And she still has like some bad matchups here and there, like uh, Ocean Breeze, Lulica, Moon Bunny is still a problem, right? Those are still all there. The thing is, people are starting to just kind of be done with Sea Phantom Politis. And if she is pre-banned, then Conquer Elias gains a lot of value as a character. And the reason you're seeing her have so much success at Worlds is because most of the openers are just outright banned. Like, if you look at most of the bans, it's like Naqual, Ran, Peyra, Sea Phantom Politis are usually the bans. And that's when you start to see Conquer Elias, you know, have an uptick in pick rate. If you're somebody who pre-bans Nequal, C Phantom Politis, uh, or you ban like Ran Peyra, uh, and you see your opponent has pre-banned C Phantom Politis, then this character gains an insane amount of value. But mostly the main reason also why she's still here is because I think she's one of the best PvE characters in the game still, and I don't want to discount that. She's still an incredible character. She's just not as strong as she used to be. Next up is Eternal Wanderer Ludwig, which is the other character alongside of Dragon King Shrine, I feel like, in this tier that could have probably had a, a pretty good claim to being under gods. So Eternal Wanderer Ludwig is just the best cleave character pretty much in the game. If you want to be a cleaver, if you're somebody who wants to play very fast with like Ran and Peyra and stuff, uh, Eternal Wanderer Ludwig is just 
that character. I feel like more so Ran than um than Peyra, right? Like Peyra, if you're more of a Peyra player, I think Requiem Moran is going to do a lot more for you. But again, if you want to live that Cleave lifestyle, Ludwig is that character. He pretty much just defines Cleave as a play style. Putting him in the third pick ban while you have Belly in pre ban just does a lot for your account and a lot for your ability to win matches. Next up, last one in the demigods is Urban Shadow Shoe. Excellent showing in some of the qualifier stages at Worlds. Just generically solid bruiser, reasonably tanky, guaranteed 8k true damage pretty much every turn, speed buff for the team, which is very real, by the way. People constantly are underestimating how strong speed buff actually is. Getting the speed buff on such a short cooldown because this character is going to go S3, S1, S3 as its basic play pattern, right? Like you're going to basically have like full uptime on speed buff. It's just going to be generating a lot of safe and consistent damage while also just being an injury win condition. Um, Operation Cream Pastry, the S3, just basically two taps most characters in the entire game. Just overall, like the most generically like safe bruiser, I feel like that doesn't require you to have high risk, high reward. Like Landy is basically a high roll character. If you want you know, misconsistency, then I think it's Urban Shadow Shoe is the pickup. Next tier is above average in the current meta. And this first one is probably going to surprise some of you. And that is Arbiter Vildred, who notoriously was in the uh, lowest tiers for the longest time. So obviously, Smilegate did us a solid, gave us 50 Fates Gaze for free before the end of the atrocious Hall of Trials challenge mode, uh, where they'll pay out basically... Uh, half or less of a EE to most of the player base, but they were at least kind enough to give us one copy under the current system, right? And most people chose to invest it in Arbiter Vildred as opposed to just taking, you know, a small percentage hike on Briar Witch and a speed buff. And that kind of paid off pretty huge because Arbiter Vildred was already having some success as like an anti-aggression tool. So people were building him like 5,000 attack, 300 crit damage, like really low speed on six torrent pieces. And if he procced Gab on Alexis Basket with six torrent before the exclusive equipment, he could wipe out an entire team pretty easily. Now imagine what happens when he has on revive 30% more damage in that scenario. Uh, yeah, so Descending Blade is back on the menu is basically what that means. So this character with the EE in certain scenarios can absolutely just wipe entire teams off the face of the earth. Like if they don't have a way to seal him or hit him with some extinction, right? If they're trying to play aggressive on you, he claps back really hard. And this is before we get to the point where we talk about it's not just that torrent build, right? What if he's on like a 20k HP degen counter build on Moonlight Dreamblade, right? You have no idea like what version of Arby you're going to be fighting against because you might blow up like you know spend all of your cooldowns on a 20k RB degen, kill him but not extinct him or seal him and he comes back with 70% dodge rate and that massive HP pool and damage his counters are just going to just completely rip through you, right? I have been sick for most of the week, so I haven't had a chance to play RB myself. But watching players that I really, you know, trust their opinion on, like Elf Mage, right? RB seems very good right now. Like even my fellow guildmates, right? They're all telling me RB is a very real thing right now. And I'm inclined to agree with what little I have seen so far. So do take it with a little grain of salt, but... Arby is definitely back, it seems. Bellion uh, is here. This is largely because she's one of the most reliable ways to dealing with book New Moon Luna. Um, just in general, the character has probably the strongest passive in the game in Shackles of Suppression. Like, you don't want to deny, like not have access to this. Like, if your opponent is book stacking and somehow they don't have this pre-ban, like, you're going to want to put this character under ban protection. There's been a number of times this season... Where windmilling Bellion in the third band protect, uh, protect slot definitely has won me some games. And just overall is probably the most desirable character I feel like to have on your arena defense. Because let's be honest, if you don't have Bellion on your arena defense, 
you're probably getting Luna Cleave because Luna Cleave basically solves every other defense that doesn't have Bellion, right? So that might be something uh, that's worth inv uh, your time, worth considering. Uh, Briar Witch's area just always been a strong, um, aggressive pick, full strip, defense break, anti revive synergy, obviously kind of a big deal now with Blood Moon Haste being in the meta, as well as RB potentially making a resurgence. EE opens up a new build in the fact in the sense that you can play like a 300 plus speed cleave briar witches area but i only feel like the highest tier players like the the biggest of whales the ones with the most uh speed gear like 25 plus uh speed on a lot of their pieces are really going to take advantage of that build for the every epic seven player the average epic seven player i think that briar witches area with the exclusive equipment is still very much the same it's like uh, a slight bump to your equipment score makes her a little bit more usable, but uh, overall it doesn't really change too much. Whereas Arby's EE is an actual game changer. Still a strong unit, um, but between Arby and Briarwitch, I think Arby does have the better EE. Uh, Mediator Kuwerik, Mr. Evergreen. People say he fell off, um, but he's one of the few characters in the game that's going to save you from getting like sealed and, you know, stunned and death broken by Ambitious Tywin, right? So if you're struggling against like Luna or Ambitious Tywin and they're banning Laia, uh, Mediator is pretty much your only go-to, right? We are in a control-heavy meta and he is basically one of the most reliable ways to deal with certain forms of control, right? Like if you don't have him, I think it becomes immediately uh, obvious, right? Like when certain pieces are off the board, like if Laia is pre-banned and they first picked Luna... Like, Mediator and Infinite Horizon Acades are, like, two of the only things on your shortlist you can scramble for, right? And Mediator is a guaranteed reliable way to get out of scenarios, whereas that might not necessarily be the case for Infinite Horizon Acades. So I still think he deserves a nod, uh, some kind of mention here, uh, especially because people say he's fallen off. But again, he's one of the characters I've found myself using quite a bit because, again, he's... One of the few outs to some of the really, truly nightmarish things in this meta. Requiem Rowana. Uh, character's just really, really stupidly strong. Uh, honestly, I was tempted to put her in Demigods. But I think she's just not as accessible or as usable for most of the, the players. If you're somebody who plays Para a lot, like Requiem Rowana is an amazing pickup for you. Because the two of them go together like uh, Peanut Butter and Jelly. Para gives you that uh, turn one access... The unbuffable and the restrict to shut down all of their setup. Then Rowana goes, uh, pushes back the enemy team, resets the cooldowns, and now you're just in a commanding tempo position. Like basically, Para Rowana together just gives you just such a strong grip on the control of the game. And if that's something you're trying to, to, to do, if you're trying to play fast and play like a tempo oriented playstyle, then I think that's uh, where you'd want to pick up Requiem Rowana. She's probably the character that I'm going to personally try to pick up because I have a pocket Para and having access to that Wombo combo seems very, very strong to me. Uh, Specimen says Xander's boy. Uh, and I guess Nezuko's as well, right? Uh, basically the, the breakout star for Worlds qualifiers so far. Um, the thing is, he's just solid right now, right? If you have a draft that's set up to take advantage of him with Ambitious Tywin, or like Unbound Knight Arwell. He's just very good. His damage is very good. His game plan is, you know, pretty out there. Like everybody knows exactly what it is, right? But if it, it, you can employ it effectively, he just picks up dubs. And unlike certain other uh, characters, his passive, which he doesn't have, right? It can't be sealed. So you can't seal his, uh, his dodge chance. So he doesn't have some of the weaknesses that somebody like Odin might have. Uh, like say, you know, a Nequal seal, right? He doesn't have to worry about that. So if you could protect him well, draft around him well, he is very, very strong. Uh, one of the higher damage character uh, output characters you can play currently, I feel like, uh, in the format. Uh, I should take this time under hard to tell here uh, to talk about Remnant Violet. I feel like Remnant Violet, by the way, probably ends up being in the above average uh, meta because I feel like he is very akin to Specimen Says. Uh, after his changes, but time will tell. We'll vi uh, revisit this section in a little bit. Let's move on now to average. These are characters that I think have some use in the metagame, right? They're like more like fourth, fifth picks that you can play. 
uh, from time to time. Maybe a third pick scenario. Uh, they do have use cases, but they are few and far between. Uh, Apocalypse Ravi. I know this is going to seem really high for a lot of people, but people keep trying to play these like non damage drafts where they're like, I have Blood Moon Haste and Dragon Bride Senya and Laya and like a Soul Weaver, like an Infinite Horizon of Cades or something. Apoc lives to destroy those drafts, right? Because she can't be one shot by those characters and she just injures them all down and just sustains through them. So in these like non-committal like tempo drafts where they're just trying to take as many turns to charge their Laya or just win the game through just haste counters and like no real hard carry, Apocalypse Robbie just completely dunks those matchups. And so I think she's worth having and having built for that reason. She's not very strong, but she has that one niche. And that one niche just happens to be one of the common predominant play styles right now. Next up is Archdemon and Shadow. This one probably also might take some of you by surprise. It was only shown once at Worlds. But ER Genua and certain ER characters, one of the only real ways you can deal with them is Soul Burn Ignore ER on a seal, which is obviously one, New Moon Luna, which is why she's up here at the top, right? Uh, and the only other Soul Burn Ignore ER seal is Archdemon Shadow. So a common strategy that certain people have started to employ is to take a mid-speed Archdemon Shadow on speed set with a ton of damage on it on Ancient Book. And if they get a turn, just Soul Burn into Genua to seal him and then just kill him in one hit with the explosive amount of damage you built on the character. Like uh, just a straight up, I'm here to glass cannon burst out your Genua and that's it. That's all it does, right? That is her only purpose is just I come in, I seal one thing and I try to burst it in a single hit. It, gone are the days of a uh, ADS trainer where you just sit there and uh, try to counter out a game. That's not what ADS is here for. She is here simply to come in with book, soul burn, blow up a character and be like tuxedo mask. My job is done here and bow out. That's the whole character. That's why she's here. Uh, Astromancer Elena, just good in, you know, uh, arena or world arena matches where you just don't want to have to deal with the threat of counters, right? The character is obviously good in cleave, but largely I think you're using her more versus like you know, the, the AI versions of PvP, like Guild Wars or Arena, that's kind of primarily her use because she just makes things predictable. You don't have to deal with random happenstance, random chance on a character that says, hey, you can't really counter. And you'll notice that with a lot of characters that are kind of like floating around this tier or the one above, they basically have some mechanic that, or they stop some mechanic from happening in the game. And as such, I don't think they can ever truly be worse than average that's why Astromancer Lane is here. Uh, Commander Pavel is basically the budget version of Ludwig. He is cleave in a can before we had the better cleave in a can. I still think he is very good. Um, I still use him. I, a lot of people were probably shocked when I was playing New Moon Luna that I actually do Pavel cleave from time to time. Uh, yes, I do have him. Yes, I do have him geared. He is actually uh, my friendship farming character, right? Like if you have me on your friends list, he's the one you'll probably be playing with an adventure because I think he is a very, very good farmer for adventure mode as well. But you're not taking a Moonlight 5 star, I feel like, for that. Uh, this is again for those of you guys who like to cleave and you don't have all the cleave options. Like obviously Ludwig is the best one. After that, Rowana is a pretty good pickup uh, or even like Astromancer. But like Pavel, if you have all those, might be worth uh, a consideration. He's good, just not, like, great. Uh, Desert Jewel Basar, largely here because, one, Peyra has made a massive resurgence in the meta, and he is still the best answer in the game to that character. Uh, also here because having DJB on uh, Sweet Miracle, right, or Eternus, is a pretty decent out to a combination of, like, Newman, Luna, Sea Phantom, Politis, Ambitious Tywin. That is a fairly common arena defense. Uh, DJB is a pretty good out to that because essentially Paldus goes, you hopefully have enough ER and DGB to not get pushed back. He pushes up because of Eternus and then you just kind of, you know, oh, okay, uh, cleanse everything and I get immunity, right? Um, in that scenario, like Luna probably still ends up stripping you based on speed, but you get the point. She is one of the few outs to that scenario and also is good versus Para, 
which is why he lands himself here. Uh, he would probably be higher if it wasn't for the fact that he still has the worst stat pool in the game for a Soul Weaver. Like if he had Haste stat line, my guy would probably be like up here, right? But he unfortunately is cursed with Tamarin stat line, which is dog. Uh, next up, Designer Lilibet. This character is pretty much only here because she is good versus certain types of cleave, specifically control cleave. And your only outs in those scenarios are Edward Elric and Designer Lilibet. And Edward is a collab limited that is going to be going on two years without a rerun and probably isn't going to get a rerun if I'm being honest with you because I'm pretty sure we only collab with them to promote the FMA gotcha, which bombs. And, you know, some of the other actors that have been in FMA have passed away and they don't usually like collabing uh, too much outside of that. So it's kind of like a, hey, uh, D Dilibet here, she might be like your one and only out to certain scenarios. So uh, if you're struggling versus like the control cleaves, this is a an okay character. Next up is Lone Crest and Bologna. Um, This one is probably going to be shocking to some of you to see how low she is. Um, C Phantom Politis really did a number on any fighting spirit character. Uh, this character just takes too long to bat back in the presence of that. Um, and then also a lot of these like incidental AOE characters aren't really that good into Dragon Bride Senya, right? Like nothing feels worse than being like, I picked Lone Crescent and Bologna, and you're like, oh, cool. I batted back and I procced Genua and Dragon Bride Senya at the same time. It feels really, really bad. You can't just generically throw Lone Crest and Bologna out there. I think that of the, the fighting spirit crowd, which is like her and Lionheart, and I know martial artist Ken isn't a fighting spirit character, but I kind of lumped them all together because they all feel similar-ish, right? In like terms of like the matchups that you'd want to bring them into. Uh, she's the best one because her single target damage alone, like standalone, is exceptional, right? The main reason you normally would play her for the bat back, right? That's kind of a liability and inconsistent right now. But at least when she gets a turn, you know that Soulburn S1 or S3 just completely nukes a character from orbit, like just deletes them. So I think that gives her some inherent value. But otherwise, like inconsistency and the fact that she's hard to gear... And she could just be blown up in one hit, even if you have Stellar Gear, are uh, reasons to not really favor her right now. Uh, Solitary of the Snow. So this one, I'll be real with you, I only have this here because she denies focus. That's it. I refuse to put her lower because she denies focus. She denies an entire mechanic. And if RB ends up being a thing, uh, well, this is a character that stops focus. If Sylvan Sage Vivian becomes a thing, this character stops focus. But Solitaria... Um, does not feel super particularly great in a lot of matchups right now. Maybe she's like decent here against like Urban Shadow Shoe. But again, I feel like being an AoE character that is not Abyssal, that is not Navy Captain Landy, or is not the Arbiter that kills your entire team is a liability right now. It gets you killed because you either get countered by some nonsense your opponent has, you proc some kind of BS passive, etc., etc. So it just doesn't feel worth it to play solitary of the snow i feel like in 2024 but again she denies an important game mechanic so i'm not going to put her any lower than this all right let's move on to low tier heroes i'll explain my logic for why all these end up here uh architect Leica, surprisingly hard to draft like you can play her in like the fifth pick slot and the thing is damage on certain characters like Janua and like gala right they're so high that they just delete characters anyway. So, like, why do I need to go through the hoop of playing an ML that needs a soul burn and a book? And, you know, I need to guarantee have, like, turn one. Like, I don't need any of that with Genoa, right? I just press buttons. I win game with those characters. They're just way more resilient than Architect Laika. Um, and so that's kind of why, like, Architect Laika is here. Uh, Closer Charles. Um... He's just too hard to gear, and there's just better openers, right? He's not terrible. Like, some people have made him work. I've played against people who have made him work against me. But, like, you're really, like, you really have to be committed to playing Closer Charles to make him work. Uh, Dark Corvus. This might be a surprise to you guys, but, like, Dark Corvus has always been, like, all reliable. 
it, the character, even when he wasn't good in like World Arena, he was like the best Arena character in the game, the best Guild War character in the entire game. All right, well, I don't know if you've been paying attention to the current state of uh, PvP, but like everything seals now. Um, and everything injures now. And every defense on Arena is playing Bellion, so you can't soul burn this character. So, like, this character, it's nightmarish to play him in World Arena because everyone's on Death Dealer Ray or, like, Shu, right? So that's already a knock against him there. But his old stomping grounds are actually being taken away from him as well because in order to deal with the new threats, everyone needs to make sure that you can't have souls. You can't have HP scaling. Like, those are the first things that people are trying to target in this meta. Faithless Lydica. I'll be honest with you. Faithless Lydica is probably, like, an actual above-average character. But most people who are watching this video that are looking at a tier list do not have the gear to make Faithless Lydica that good. You need her to be, like, 305 plus speed. And even then, if you run into an average Para at top level, which is 310 plus... The ones in Emperor and Legend that are actually good are about 320 or so. Um, there's just no way in hell you're going to get Faithless Lydica that fast, right? She's 114 base speed, and you have to contend with these 124 plus openers. Like, she's just not fast enough. Like, even though the character's kit on paper is just busted, you just can't realistically get this character fast enough to actually get her to see some use unless you are literally um, somebody with just insane speed gear and you're truly just dedicated to playing the character and even then i think you just have a higher win rate taking all that same gear and just jamming on luna ran para see phantom Paladus. uh fallen cecilia still desperately needs a buff but still one of the best anti-cleave characters in the game that's why she's here that's the only thing that saves her from the absolute bottom tier is that having like your tanks be like albedo and then you also pick fallen cecilia your opponent has to give you one of those mitigation knights and she's still just really, really good uh, at that. She's just all reliable. You know, just gives a big barrier. Holds Arius. That's it. Nothing special. Uh, Judge Kisei. People say this character is very good right now. I have yet to really ex truly experience this. I feel like Judge Kisei is pretty much the same phenomena as Faithless Lydica. Judge Kisei on paper should probably work but the gear required to make her good you could jam it on so many other characters and have so much more success couple that with the fact that she desperately needs a book holder to do her job she is basically like locking up three slots in your draft like you have to basically go judge kisei two mages because otherwise they ban out the mage and your character is useless and then obviously judge kisei has to be in your like ban protection because then they just ban out the judge kisei and she is not doing anything for you she's just too hard for the average person to actually use effectively. Uh, Last Rider Crow, I just don't think he is particularly very strong right now. He is straight up. Um, yeah, just he dies to like everything. It feels like in one hit, right? I know that he has a good matchup versus Ambitious Tywin. That's the one that everybody keeps telling me about. But like still dies to Genoa, still dies to Gala in one hit. Gets absolutely blown up by a Blood Moon Haste, right? Like, you can just Soul Burn or have high enough F to just rip through the immunity that you're giving your team. He could just prey on that. Um, and even then, the quote-unquote good matchup on Tywin, bro, he can literally just wait for the immunity, the two-turn immunity to wear off on Siegfried, and then just slam, right? Like, if you don't create enough tempo in your draft, which, let's be honest, you're on LRK, so you're probably not. He could just slam Flash after two turns of immunity, because... You're what, seven turn cooldown? If I just choose to ignore LRK and leave him stranded, and then I can just pick up the, the dub by killing everything that's death broken around your LRK. Right? Like it just doesn't even feel like it's that good of a matchup. He feels super, super bad unless your opponent has got like a belly in defense on arena. Like I don't use him anywhere else. I just don't think he's particularly very strong. Next up is my girl, Lionheart Sermia. I also think she is pretty bad. I think she is a casualty of Sea Phantom Paladus and also a casualty of some of these other characters like Dragon Bride Senya and like Janua and stuff, right? Like there can be a game where you look at and go, hey, this is a Lionheart game. And then you get everything right. Like they get the early counter, right? And then you press S3 and you're like, cool. 
I didn't kill anybody. I proc their Genua. I proc their Dragon Bride Senya. I didn't crit their Landy. It countered and salvoed and killed half my team. What was the point? <laughs> like, like, that's the whole thing. Like, even when it's a Lionheart game, it doesn't feel like a Lionheart game. It, it straight up feels like you have to be gear gapping people, brain gapping them, or just getting lucky. Like, it's it's so weird. I, I just feel like Lionheart Sarmia, just her poor base stats are, like, finally catching up to her. That's what it honestly feels like. Like, this is my favorite character in the game, and I still don't think she's very good in the current format. Next up is LQC. Um, she can kill a dark unit in one hit. But the thing is, to do that reliably, you have to be on the slow build, which gets controlled. And if you're on the fast build, it can still be kind of disrupted or interrupted, and it might not have enough damage to kill. And then you have to ask yourself, like, amongst all the characters that one shot in the game, <coughs> excuse me, is LQC really, like, better than just playing Janua or Gala or even, like, Shaltir, right? Like, any of these, like, really fast, like, heavy hitters, I feel like they all just do their job better than LQC. Like, her one saving grace, right, is that she has Extinction, which could be relevant, but, like, bro, Spez is right here, is more reliable, has safer draft paths, right? Like, I just, I don't really see... Um, the value in LQC here. Next up is martial artist Ken. Unlike the other fighting spirit characters, again, yes, I know he's not, but he has the same like spots. The spots you'd pick LCBN or Lionheart. That's usually where you're also trying to pick like martial artist Ken, right? The thing about martial artist Ken is that he excels against characters that use critical strikes. All right, quick. Let's just check real fast. Um, Dragon Bride Senny doesn't strike. New Moon Luna doesn't. Sea Phantom doesn't, Tywin doesn't, Haste doesn't, Death Dealer Ray doesn't. Okay, Landy does. Zeo might not. His first attack certainly doesn't. Uh, people have built Abyssal without crit now, so that's a possibility. This one doesn't, doesn't. Uh, Ludwig can just one-shot you. Shu has a 50-50 chance of being either the ER or the crit build, and if it's the ER build, well then, that's kind of rough. And we've already established in previous account reviews that if I just injured down the Ken, he's no threat to me because I keep him out of Sigurd's range. So that's also not particularly good. Uh, and then you start to look down here and it's like, we have to get to basically like the average meta, right? For this character to start really, you know, meaning something. And even then, some of these characters are pretty good against him. So like, it's just not his meta. It's not that he's a bad character. It's just, what are you picking him into? Because all the commonly played top tiers don't trigger him, or they just one-shot him like a Janua. So, like, he just doesn't have any value in a lot of meta matches right now. That's why he's so low. Like, he is probably objectively in the best shape of, of ML Ken, Bologna, and Sermia. It's just the meta doesn't favor him. Like, I could see him easily popping up with a slot or two on the tier list in like a, a meta or two based on th how things shape up, what they release, what they box, so on and so forth. Uh, Pirate Captain Flam. Uh, I'm going to keep this one pretty short. It's not, it does not bode well for you when your two worst matchups are commonly picked characters in the second and third slot, right? Like you, stunning into Dragon King Sharoon is a recipe for a disaster. Little known fact Pirate Captain Flan's S1 triggers Green Selene's S2. You're going to have to press S1 at some point. The second you do, your whole team dies to Selene. How often is Selene played at every level of play? She's like a top five pick character probably, right? You would say? So yeah, that doesn't bode well for you. Even though we're in a control meta, Flan is like got the one collection of debuffs. That makes her atrociously bad to pick. Sage Ball and Cezanne. This one also, we're going to keep this one real, real, real quick. Historically, the worst matchup in the game for Sage Ball and Cezanne. It's like a 9-1 to one matchup in favor of the opponent is Ambitious Tywin. The most played knight in the game. So yeah, that's kind of why. Uh, Silverblade Araminta has some pretty awesome use cases with Newman Luna for cleaving in like Guild Wars or Arena. If you could find somebody without 
a belly in on their defense. But, like, other than that, like, it's fine. Like, she honestly has the potential, I think, to rise up. I think red Araminta stonks might be a bit higher, though, than Silverblade. Like, a fast red Araminta is probably what you would rather... Like, don't waste your MLs on this, your Mystics. Just build a fast red Araminta. Like, I think that if you want to play an Araminta, that's the version of the character to play right now. Uh, Spectre? It's just not her meta anymore, bro. Like, everything just does too much AoE damage, right? So if you actually try to play this character, like, it's going to get blown up. Like, the, the saving grace of it getting blown up is, hey, it's at least it triggers your Dragon Bride Sen and your Genua and your Haste and all the other nonsense you probably got on your team. But uh, her game impact, kind of low. She's, like, super easy to deal with right now. Especially when you have a girl that is blazing fast that literally says, hey, I'm going to rip you out of stealth for free. Uh, that's also not a good feeling. Uh, Spirit Iseline, she's just always going to be niche. Like, unless they make this character broken, she's going to be niche. She can never be anything other than she is with her current design. Either broken or niche. Perfectly balanced character. Um, you'll use her once in a blue moon unless you're one of those psychos that play her with Christy every single game. That's pretty much all there is to say about her. Uh, Straze, same thing as, like, Architect Laika. There's a million other characters that one-shot that do more things that are more resilient. And then also, <clears throat> we're in a format where... Randomly killing the wrong thing uh, lets you just die for free to Blood Moon Haste and his team. So that kind of sucks. Uh, top model Lulika. Uh, I've said it before in a number of videos, but only really Kenny can make this character work. I've seen people try to make this character. It's like Faithless Lydica or Judge Kisei, bro. Just take the gear, put it on somebody else. Like, I don't care if she's your favorite. She's just too damn hard to use reliably. She's just really not worth the investment. Like, she's usable, right? Like, I have died to fifth pick, you know, Blazing Fast top model Lulica on book that tries to soul burn me to eke out a win to see if they got the gear gap on me, right? Like, that happens, right? That's what saves her from not being in the last tier. But, like, she's pretty much right there, right? Like, she's, like, borderline. She's, like, in between these two tiers. Okay, and the last tier here is Roll Tier, named after Mega Man's sister Roll, uh, because she is always notoriously like the worst character in Marvel vs. Capcom games. That's why they call it Roll Tier. <clears throat> Shoutouts to Evo, which is the fighting game championships, which will be this weekend. If I'm somehow still alive, I will attempt to try to watch it from the comfort of my bed. I recommend you try and do so uh, as well. It is like a fighting game Christmas. Uh, it's absolutely worth your time. Super hype matches. Some of the best stuff in esports. Anyways... The characters in this tier I feel like are truly hard and there's basically no real reason to choose them. I know that there are maid specialists out there, shout outs to Car6, um, and a number of other like ER gamers that use maid, but I really just feel like you would be better off investing in a different strategy. Like I feel like as far as revivers go, somehow Ruel of Light feels stronger than Maid Chloe because Maid Chloe just revives your team. At like a piddly 20%, which is not particularly very great. Like the ER is the saving grace on this, but like for healing and revive, mage just not it. I feel like I really just don't think it's it. I think Ruel of Light is better at protecting one key damage dealer, <clears throat> right? That you might want to actually save, but both of them I still think are truly hard, especially in the face of haste. <clears throat> Excuse me. As far as Operator Segret goes here, um, just not really usable in any scenario. It's just too difficult to set up. Just truly hard stats, hard to use for most of the player base. Um, might not even kill most of the time, if I'm being honest with you, given like the relative HP pools of characters, um, <clears throat> and, uh, anti-crit running a bound, right? Just overall, not very strong. And then Kron's always just been a meme, right? Like his only use case is like, Popping off for Hinojin and winning arena fights on auto if your name is Trista Wolf, right? Like, he's really not that good. Um, the fact that he's also a casualty of C Phantom Politis is also just really, really funny, right? Like, because he's a fighting spirit character as well. Uh, he just, he dies to so many things for free, man. Like, bad stat lines. He dies in one hit. A Soulborn ignore ER. Fighting spirit just completely messes him up. Oh, man. Like, there's just so many things. Like, He's just a disaster of a unit. Like, he just needs, like, a whole class Zodiac sign change, man. Like, you just, just change the whole character, man. He's just, he's truly awful. 
Now to wrap it up, hard to tell here. Uh, Remnant Violet, as I already talked about earlier, I think he's probably somewhere between above average to average. I'll play it safe and put him here, right? In uh, average, this is where I hypothesize he'll end up falling, right? He got a damage increase, but I don't think it was particularly like that insane. Right from like watching him, he uh, you know, people play him earlier this morning before I recorded this. It's not like he was like outright one shotting uh, some of the heavy hitters in the format with Massacre, right? And that was people like fully dedicated to speed and damage. Um, Life Steel doesn't seem like it has changed all that much, right? Like he's more usable, but doesn't seem like absolutely insane. And I'll be honest with you, after seeing Sylvan Sage Vivian. I have not seen anything like particularly very good. My gut feeling is that she's in low tier hero, even after <laughs> her changes. But I'll wait until more time has passed, more time has elapsed to kind of render my verdict on her. Uh, but for right now, you can pick her up if you think she's hot. But realistically, at best, she's probably like average, but most likely like low tier hero. But yeah, there you go. That's like, what, 45 minutes of me yapping while being sick? Hopefully that was... Uh, a good enough fill of content to get your Sue fix for the week. Um, I'll probably return when I'm feeling 100% sometime next week. So unfortunately, no, there won't be a fix it Friday this week. I'm just going to focus up on trying to rest up and be the best version of myself. So that, that way I can come out stronger next week um, and try to deliver on things like maybe a how to play New Moon Luna, stuff like that. Thanks for watching. As always, enjoy the rest of your day, the rest of your week. Catch you in the next one. Later.